Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. In this episode, I give you the full course Understanding Photography Basics with Simple Words. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. My name is Serge Ramadi. I'm a French photographer living in Paris, right now in Los Angeles, and I make two tutorials per week. Click here if you want to get the raw file of this episode for free and all the past episodes. We're talking hundreds of profiles from all over the world. And also to subscribe to my newsletters to get amazing, good discount on all my training. Click here to subscribe to my YouTube channel on YouTube. In last episode, I showed you how to make a full website with Squarespace, including e-commerce, blog, the whole cycle. Check it out if you want to make a website because it's really cool what you can do in one hour with Squarespace. This week, I'm gonna offer you a course that I did a couple of years ago, which is called Understanding Photography with Simple Words. What it is, is really an introductory course and taking all the fundamentals of photography and I'm trying to explain it with the most simple words possible. So we're gonna cover like AV mode, TV mode, manual mode, exposure composition, how to shoot at night, how to shoot during the day, uh, rules of composition, it's a full course. Uh, that has been on sale, which I'm offering for free. I got great reviews on it. It's about one hour long. In the description of this YouTube video, you can jump to a chapter if you're more interested into one topic, you know, over another. So here it comes, understanding photography with simple words. Welcome to this first lesson of understanding the basics of photography. The first thing we're gonna go into is the aperture value mode. Now, what is the aperture value mode? It's a mode on your camera, which is called AV. You have you know, a little wheel on the camera where you can choose different mode, and this one is called AV. And the whole idea of the aperture mode is that you decide what the aperture is, and the camera is gonna decide what time is gonna open the shutter of the camera. Now, what is the aperture? The aperture is this little piece of metal that gives different size of holes. Uh, it, this aperture can be small or the hole can be big and we say we have a big aperture. So what type of sizes do we have? Well, when the, the diaphragm or the aperture is completely open, we say it's open at f1.4. When the size of the aperture is a bit smaller, we say we are at f2.8. When the size is a bit uh, smaller it's at f.4 and when it's really small it's at f16 which is a bit strange because bigger the number smaller the aperture why is that because it's basically a mathematical formula well uh, if you divide 1 by 1.4 you get a size and that's going to be the diameter of the circle of the aperture if you divide 1 by 1.4 you get something like 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 and that's going to be the the size of the, the diameter of the, uh, of the aperture. If you divide one by 2.8, you will get a smaller number because you have a smaller diameter. If you divide one by four, you get you know, 0.25, you get a smaller aperture. If you divide one by 16, you get an even smaller number and you get a smaller aperture or smaller hole. So bigger the number, smaller is the aperture. Now, why, what does it do to have a big or a small aperture? Well, what it does, it handles what we call the depth of field. The depth of field is, uh, this drawing is taken from the side. You have the camera, you have the aperture, and you have these trees. The very uh, light green trees are blurry. They are not sharp. The trees which are dark green are very sharp, and these trees again are not sharp. So if you look from the side, you see that when the aperture is big, you know, you have a small number like f1.4 or f2. So that means the aperture is totally open. You have a small depth of field. You know, the it's gonna be very narrow. We say we have a narrow depth of field. Now, if you close a bit of diaphragm and get a smaller aperture, your depth of field is getting bigger. And if you make it even smaller, your depth of field is getting even bigger. So now what does that mean to have a big depth of field or a small depth of field? What does it look like? Well, let's check it out. That's what it looks like. Here we have a big aperture, 2.8. The, the aperture is very large, the hole is big, and uh, you can see that the status is sharp and the background is completely blurry. So it's basically an artistic decision. I want to get something sharp and the rest 
uh, blurry, so I'm gonna go for a big aperture, 2.8 for example. And your lens basically, some lenses can only open at four, these are usually more cheaper lens and the more professional lens, you can open the, the aperture, you know, usually they are bigger, you can open up to 2.8 for example. So this is the opposite. We close the aperture very much at f20, and now we have the status which is sharp, but we also have the background which is getting more sharp. It's not completely sharp, but you can, it's not as blurry as this. So it's really an artistic decision. Do I want, you know, what do I want sharp? What do I want uh, in focus? Basically, big aperture are used to take portraits, to make it simple, and um, small aperture with big numbers is to take landscapes because in landscape we want most of it to be sharp. Now, one thing you should know is that as the aperture is getting big, wide open, the quantity of light to get a proper exposure that the camera needs is very little because the, the aperture is big, so the light is coming very fast. So look at the speed. The speed here was 1 640th of a second. That's a light speed. And now that we have have a closed aperture, or a smaller hole, the speed was 1 40th of a second, which is still fast, but it's a lot slower than 160 40th of a second. Because in AV mode, you decide the f-stop and the computer within the camera is going to decide the time to make a proper exposure. So basically, you have a scene. Do I want to make a portrait? Do I want to make a landscape? You take an artistic decision of, you know, if you want everything in focus or just something not in focus. And so that's, you know, where you go uh, F28 or F20 or F10 or whatever. And uh, we're going to see a lot of examples of that later on. And the camera is going to decide the time. Now, that's what the AV mode is. Next, we're going to see the TV mode, which is a time value mode, which is the opposite. Okay, the time value mode. The time value mode is the opposite of the AV mode. You decide the time and the camera is going to decide the aperture. So, what type of uh, time do we have, of speed do we have in a camera? Well, roughly this is how it goes. This is the fastest speed that it, ha it has, one eight thousand of a second. Imagine how fast that is. You need to have a lot of light to capture a photo at one eight thousand of a second. Then it goes down to, you know, to one thousand four one four thousand of a second, one one thousand of a second, one five hundred of a second, one one hundred of a second, no, one forty of a second, one tenth of a second, and then it goes to 0 0.3 of a second, 0 0.5 of a second, one second, you know, five, 10 seconds, and 30 seconds. That's usually the longest. So this is very slow shutter speed. Shutter speed is basically the time that the aperture is open where the light can come in. We call that the shutter speed. And this is very fast shutter speed. Now, you see here it says freehand shooting. Basically, if you are at one eight thousand of a second down to one forty of a second, you can shoot using uh, your hands. You don't need a tripod. You can just shoot during the day. And that's usually this is during the day conditions too. You know, you need a lot of light even to shoot at one forty of a second. So during the day, you don't need a tripod. You can take proper exposure photo. But when the shutter speed goes under one forty of a second, you need a tripod. Some very professional photographer can get down to one thirty or one tenth of a second without using a tripod, but it takes a bit of training to really hold still the camera. But take this as a stable data and you won't get blurry shots. If you go under one forty of a second, then you need to take a, a tripod, otherwise your photo is going to be blurry. Now, this is an example of a high speed photo. I, uh, th this was during the day and it was only possible to do this photo during the day where I had a, a jumper, you know, jump like this in the air and I took the photo, I wanted to freeze him in action, so I took the photo at one, one thousand of a second. And so he was sharp and it was enough light, you know, the aperture was probably around like four or something and uh, it worked. And that's how I used the TV mode because I really wanted to make sure that I could freeze the action. This is another example of completely the opposite. The speed here was 30 seconds, which is the longest you can do in most of the camera. And 30 seconds, look what happened to the clouds. The clouds got all fuzzy, you know, stretched out. The water is silky looking. I love this type of photography. We call this long exposure photos. And I forced in 30 seconds to get that result. 
Next, we have another example of long exposure photo. This was, I was at 8.8 .8 and the speed was four seconds. I liked four seconds because clouds, you know, became stretchy a little bit. The water started to be silky looking and I like that in landscape. So that was one of the time I used this time value. Now, what happens if you take a photo and let's say you're at 8.7 because you're taking a landscape and, uh, you know, the uh, computer says, okay, now I need one thirty of a second or one twenty of a second. You know, you just press the button on your camera, you have set the f-stop and the computer tells you, well, now the speed is at f30. You know that at f30, your photo is not going to be sharp. And uh, that, believe me, will happen a lot of uh, most of the time. So how to get around that? Well, we get around that using what we call the ISO, which we'll see in the next video. Okay, what is ISO? ISO is a way to uh, solve a problem. What is the problem? The problem, for example, is you're taking a landscape. You are at F7, F8, because you know that's an F value that's going to give you a sharp photo. And you press a shutter and the camera tells you, well, the speed that I need to get a proper exposure is one tenth of a second. And you know that under one fortieth of a second, you know, you are here at one tenth, under one fortieth of a second, you're going to get a blurry short. So we have different value of ISO on our cameras. It usually starts around 100 and it goes the whole way up to 6,400 and even higher on eye hand cameras. Now, Every time, so the value goes like this, 100, 125, 160, 200, 250, 320, 400. On most cameras, that's, you know, the settings, that's how they are. Every time you go higher and higher in number, you double the sensibility of the camera, you know, of the, of the computer inside, of the chip. The chip is going to be twice more uh, sensitive to the light. So... If you're at one tenth of a second at 100 ISO and you put 125 of an ISO, now you're not going to be anymore at one tenth. You're probably going to be at 120, which is still too slow, but you can then go to 160 and now your speed needed is going to be faster. You're going to be at 100, 140 of a second and you will be able to take the shot. So that's a great way to not have to use a tripod and to be able to make photos even when the light is getting a bit darker, you know, inside or you know, the sun is coming down, you can just boost the ISO and you don't need to take out a tripod and you will get a proper exposed photo. Now that there is a downside to this. Uh, more you boost the sensitivity of the chip on your camera, more you get noise. Now it's getting better these days. Camera handle noise a lot better, but I would say, you know, on high hand camera, you are like fine from like 1000 on. But on small, cheap cameras, even at 200 or 250 in ISO, you start getting noise. Now, what is noise? Well, this is noise. This was uh, taken at 3,200 ISO with a very high hand camera, but look how noisy it is. You know, it's this little grain everywhere. It's not a usable photo. So ISO is good because it can save the day where you don't have a tripod and you can still take a proper exposed photo. But you have to be careful not to go up. And if you have the possibility to use a tripod, instead of boosting the ISO, you will always get a cleaner shot. For example, this was a portrait that I did inside and it was a bit dark because the room was not, you know, was just a bit dark. So I opened it, my aperture to the max because I want him to be sharp and I wanted the wall to be a bit out of focus, a bit blurry. The speed was one, uh, one second divided by 50, one fiftieth of a second. But look, the ISO, to get a proper shot, I had to boost the ISO to 1600 to be able to get that speed because it was so dark. The photo looks okay, but if we have a closer look at the photo, uh, you will see that there is still a bit of noise. Even though I took it out in the software, you know, it's still a bit grainy. So I always try to avoid, you know, having to boost the ISO. That's my way of seeing things. For example, but it can take nice photo. I was in the middle of the night with this gentleman and I took this photo. I had a lens that could only open to f4. That was the maximum size of the aperture I can have. And I wanted to be at 140 of a second. So I had to boost the ISO at 1600 ISO so that I could get a proper exposure. So I could have one, you know, one divided by 40 of a second speed. And um, yeah, so 
and I took the noise out in a software and it's kind of a usable photo so it's still very useful to have this ISO option. Okay, the manual mode is a mode that I, I use quite often. Actually, I either use the AV mode or the manual mode. And the manual mode is very different from the AV and TV mode because on the manual mode, you decide not only the f-stop, but you also decide the time. You decide both. Now, when do we use AV uh, manual mode? It, it says to be used when you need the same exposure on different photos. For example, panoramics, shooting events, creative exposures, difficult light situation. We're going to take one by one. So panoramics, you see here, all photos have the same exposure. Uh, I want it because I'm going to merge all these photos together. So I need to, to have them to look exactly the same. So I went into manual mode. I dialed in F8 because I wanted a big depth of field. I uh, determined that one 200 of a second was you know, fast enough to get because it was during the morning, so there was a lot of light. And all the photos have the same f8 and 1 250 per second. They have the same exposure and they're going to be very easy to merge together. So that was very handy to use a manual mode. Now, how I determined that 1 250 of a second was fast enough, the way you, you work is you start off by AV mode, you, you go to f8, you press the shutter, you take a photo, and you see that your photo it looks, you know, looks good. And you look at the speed, and the speed was 1 250 per second. So then I went into the manual mode, I dialed in F8, I dialed in 1 250 of a second, because I knew I would get a proper exposure, and I took these five photos. Same exposure on all five. This is another example, shooting events. Uh, you know, when you shoot an event, this was an event I shot, and it was like a lot of different light situation, and I wanted all the photos to kind of look the same. So same thing, I went into AV mode at F4, you know, which was the largest I could go actually with the lens I was using at the time. And um, I went to 160 of a second, 160 of a second. I, I mean, I pressed the shutter speed and I saw that, you know, the 160 of a second would give me a proper exposure. So I dialed that into my camera, F4 and 160 of a second. So wherever I was walking into the event, I had the same exposure on all the photos and it made them like pretty uniform for the night you know, and the customer was pretty happy. Um, another example, creative exposures. Uh, when I, this was a scene when I was shooting straight into the sun and that's the, uh, the exposure that the camera was giving me. That was the AV mode version of it. I put in 7.1 because that's the usual value I use to have, you know, a sharp landscape. And uh, as I was in AV mode, the camera tells me, well, I'm fine at one 2,000th of a second. I took the shot and I wanted to see if I could go darker. So I went into manual mode and I dialed in F71, but I forced in one, one eight thousand of a second. So, I, you know, it was a lot faster. So a lot less light came into the camera and it got uh, darker. So I kind of didn't like that. So I tried the opposite. I dialed in one five hundred of a second and got a much lighter exposure. So that was a creative exposure. Now, this was a difficult light situation also. I was uh, trying to uh, make this portrait in the middle of the night, so I forced in my camera to be at 1 50 of a second, and you will see an example later on on this specific photo, 1 50 of a second at f4. So uh, whenever I was shooting, I had to go to 1600 ISO to get a proper exposure. But whenever I was shooting, I took you know like dozens of photos of that gentleman, all of them were sharp because all of them was at 1 50th of a second f4 1600 iso and if i was not in a manual mode and if i was in heavy mode uh, most of the time you know because there's a lot of light change you know if i point the camera a bit here to the right it's brighter than to the left you know the the speed would have changed all the time and would have gone too slow most of the time even at 1600 iso and a lot of models of my photos would have been blurry so that was great. I could get all my photos sharp because I was in manual mode and I forced in the 150 of a second, I forced in F4 and I forced in 1600 ISO. But there's a specific video later on on that specific photo. Okay, one thing which is very important to understand is the exposure compensation. You see what happens most of the time is when you take a photo, you know, you press the shutter speed, you press the button on your camera and you take a shot, for example, this shot in the middle, uh, the camera is going to tell you, okay, here's the photo. This is what I consider to be a proper exposure. 
Now that's what the camera based on the database, you know, based on thousands and thousands of examples around the world is going to calculate the time and is going to give you a photo and is going to consider that photo to be a proper exposure. Now, what if, if you want to get the photo darker, what if, if you want to get the photo lighter, uh, is there a fast way to do that? You could, of course, go manual or, you know, and change and forced in some sl slower or faster shutter speed. But there is a very easy way to do that on all the camera. It's called the exposure composition. The way it works is you have, um, basically you press a button. So it's, it di it di it's different on various cameras. Most of the time, this is a symbol of the exposure compensation. You press that button and then on the screen, you know, you have this uh, settings appearing and you can go left to go darker with using usually the wheel. You know, it shows you a little symbol of the wheel. You have a wheel on your camera and if you turn the wheel to the left, the, your photo is going to go darker. And if you turn to the right, your photo is going to go brighter. And basically, so you set your compensation, you know, either to the left or to the right, and you retake the photo. And if you went to the left, your photo, your next photo is going to be a bit darker. And if you go to the right, your photo is going to be a bit brighter. And the camera is going to change to the settings. You know, the, usually it's going to, if you're in AV mode, it's going to play with the speed just to make the photo darker or brighter. For example, on the Canon 5D Mark II, which is what I use, uh, I don't, I don't use this AV mode button. I just press the button and I use the wheel here. And if I go right, it's going to make my um, little thing go to the right and, and my next photo is going to be brighter. And if I do, go the other way around, uh, it's going to go to the left and my next photo is going to be darker. I used exposure composition all the time. You know, I just take the photo. Is it all right? Or it needs to be a bit darker or brighter. And then I just press that button or use that wheel and change it right away. You have to find it on your camera, but that's very important. Exposure compensation. Now to finish on all these different modes, all non-professional camera have a lot of other modes, you know, where, you know, you see a sun, you see a flower, a man running, a, a mountains, a portrait. What is this mode? Well, I said here, try not to use them if you understand aperture or time value mode, because what this mode does is that it sets the camera for you, but very often it's not very right. For example, if you put it on portrait, you know, with the symbol of this young lady, what is it going to do? It's going to open up the aperture to the max and it's going to take the photo because it knows that portrait, usually the person is sharp and the rest is blurry. If you put the mountains as a symbol, it's going to do the opposite. It's going to try to shut, you know, close down the aperture, put it around F7 or F8 and you take the shot. But you will get more creative and you get a lot more results just using the AV mode or the manual mode. I advise you to start by using the AV mode and you just play around, you know, you take portraits, you just open up your aperture, you take landscape, you close your aperture, that's it. And try to avoid all this, uh, you know, modes because um, they will get you much, the AV mode will get you a lot better result and a lot more control on the light. Okay, so let's look at some photo recipes so that's to illustrate all what we went over. This was a photo I took early in the morning and uh, there was quite some light, but not that much. So I put my aperture at F5 and the computer, because I was in heavy mode, told me, well, the speed is 1 uh, 80th of a second. I know that's, you know, faster than 1 40th of a second. So I went ahead and took the shot and liked it. Next photo. This was in Las Vegas, early in the morning, sunrise, same thing. Um, I was at F4 and the speed was 1 divided by 100 of a second, 1 100 of a second and ISO 100. I'm always trying to be at ISO 100. So I was a bit scared that my speed was going to go too slow. So I only went to F4 and uh, I could have gone more on the aperture because you see if, if I went up to F6 or F7, uh, the speed would have been like one, one fifty of a second, which was still fast enough to get a sharp photo at 100 ISO. But anyway, that's how I took that photo and I cannot like that. Uh, another photo, though, so that's the opposite. I used a tripod for this one and I wanted to get a long exposure because when you car pass by, this is the Champs Elysees in Paris. When the car pass by, they make streak of lights and I like that. So I went the whole way, to, I don't, don't do that often. I went at F22 on the tripod 
to force in the computer to a long exposure. And the computer told me, well, I need four seconds because you are at F22 at 100 ISO. So I was happy with four seconds because the car was just passing by and I made, it made all this trick of light and I kind of like that. Okay, complete different opposite, a portrait. That's the usual value for a portrait. I took a lens that could open to f2.8, which was the biggest aperture I could have. And um, it was an artistic decision. I wanted the background to be blurry and I wanted him to be in focus. So I was at f2.8, the speed was at 1 200 of a second. And so I knew I would get a sharp photo and I was at 100. So that's a usual, very uh, common setting for taking portraits during the day. Uh, another landscape, I wanted to, uh, I was at 4.5 because I'm 4.5, you still get everything in focus. The speed was 1 100 of a second and ISO 100. So you see every time we have landscape, we are like around 4, 5, 6 or 7. And every time we do portrait, we are on 2 or 2.8. And every time I try to be at 100 ISO. But we'll see some more example uh, in later videos on photo recipes so that you have a better understanding again of this relationship between the shutter speed, uh, the ISO and the f-stop. Okay, so let's talk about lenses. Uh, you have tons of lenses for every brand in the world and it can get quite confusing. Just check out this photo. This is just all the lens for Canon SLR. It's a lot of lens and it's a lot of money. So let's first go over a bit of theory how the lens work. Basically, the lens, the notification, the numbers on the lens indicates uh, how much do you go from wide angle to zoom and it's calculated in millimeter. For example, we can say that this is a wide angle lens. So it, we would say it's a, you know, it's a 17 or 20 millimeter lens. And as it get bigger, you know, like this could be, this is not the case, but it's just an example of 50 meter lens, 100 meter lens, 150 meter lens. Basically, here you have a little uh, glass and further away this glass is from the chip in the camera, more zoomed in you are onto the photo. And so you have two type of lenses. You have lenses that goes from a value to another value, like for example, from 17 to 40, from 40 to 70, from 70 to 200. So it's different, basically, uh, zoom uh, factors in the lens. Let me show you an example. This is the same, uh, I put my um, camera on a tripod and I just changed some lenses on it. First, I took a 17 millimeter shot. It's a wide angle shot. So the lens, you know, the, the lens is only 17 millimeter away from the chip to make it simple and it's very wide, you can see a lot into the scene. Then I went to 40 millimeter, and now look, I'm less wide angle, I'm getting closer into the scene, and then I put another lens at 70 millimeter, and now I'm zoomed in even more, and then 100 millimeter, I'm zoomed in even further, and last but not least, at 200 millimeter, I'm really zoomed in, I can see all the details in the trees. And, um, so that's basically all you have to know about lenses. Uh, of course, you have different prices and I'm gonna give you some suggestions of what to buy or what not to buy. So here I'm on B&H, which is uh, one of the biggest f Photoshop in the world. Uh, you've, you can find anything in B&H, it's in New York. And um, usually when you buy an SLR, you have a 17 to 55 or 17 to 50 uh, lens you know, sold with your SLR. This is a wide angle to about, a, what we'd say about a normal view type of uh, zoom. So you, it's a good lens to take landscape. It's gonna get a bit, can get a bit weird during the, if you do night shots, because usually this type of lens are not very quality. But if the only thing you do is landscape, the, you know, the lens you have with your camera could be enough. If you want to get a bit better on doing landscape, this is the lens I've been using for seven years to do landscape. Uh, it's a 17 to 40 millimeter. I'm using Canon, but you have the same one probably on Nikon and Sony and all the other brand. Uh, it only opens to F4. It costs about $765. And that's the one I have been using for the last uh, seven years to do 90% of my landscapes. Now, if you want to really get another uh, uh, similar lens, but even better quality, you know, you have more money, 
you can buy a 16 to 35, but instead of opening at F4 as the maximum aperture, it opens at F2.8, but the price is not the same. Usually all the lens that open at F2.8 are much more expensive. Uh, this is $1,565. The only difference I could see between the one at uh, $765 and the one at $1,565 is that I get a more sharper image with this lens and the corners of my photo are a bit more sharp than in the one at which is around $700. So this is based on your budget. If you really are serious about landscape, two type of proposal I have for you. You have as a brand, you know, uh, which could have similar, in, uh, like uh, Sigma or Tamron, uh, you know, similar uh, values, and you can go for them. They're, they, they are very good. I'm just trying to give you a basic example here. Now, if you are into portrait, this is a lens I highly suggest and you have all the brands make this one. It's the 70 to 200 F4 lens. Uh, it costs around $679. You can even find other brands which have 70 to 200 at F4, even cheaper for around $500. They make incredible portraits and they are not that expensive. Um, if you have a lot of money, you can take the same version at 2.8, but then it's $2,239. And to be honest, I have tried both. And um, well, I, I don't see that much of a difference except for the stabilization. Uh, each of these lens have different prices. They are sold either with stabilization or without stabilization. For example, this one is at $679 without stabilization and the same one at F4 is $1,239 st with stabilization. Same thing for the 2.8. Uh, this is the one uh, without stabilization uh, which is uh, no with stabilization with which is 2239 and without is 1330 of course if you do you know like a lot of weddings in church uh, you know you probably would invest in the one at two thousand dollars because stabilization in 2.8 is going to give you uh, a wider aperture so you can take uh, in low light situation very nice portraits but anyway if you I, I'm, I don't think I will ever buy this one. I have this one and I'm very happy with it with the F4 version. Now, if you have very little money and uh, you just want to have some nice photos, there is one lens which I find it, which is incredible for the price. It's the 50 millimeter 1.8. It only costs $100, $104. You have it in all the brands and you can take some really nice portrait with it. You cannot get too much close to your person because otherwise you might get some uh, distortion. But if you take like, uh, you know, uh, half size portraits, they are perfect. They are very good also for some landscape if you have, a, you know, quite some space. But the fact that it opens at 1.8, you can get some really nice portraits with very uh, narrow depths of field. It's a, an incredible lens for the price one or four dollars and um, if you only want to have one lens you know and you don't have so much money and you want to have like a lens that does everything i highly suggest you buy an 18 to 200 this will give you anything to from wide angle to portrait in one lens it's pretty light of course it doesn't open you know it op at 18 it only opens at 3.5 and at 200 it only opens at 5.6 so you cannot shoot too much in low light situation. You know, the, sh the photo is not as sharp as, as all the other lens I showed you, but it's kind of like, a, you know, it's a good lens to start if you don't have much money and you can do just about everything with that lens, 18 to 200. So there is much more to say on the lenses, but that was just some quick tips of a few suggestions if you are into landscape or portrait uh, doing photography. Okay, your camera has two modes, two type of photos you can shoot, RAW files or JPEG files. I highly recommend if you want to take some nice photos, if you really have a nice landscape or nice portrait that you want to keep uh, print in big and have the best result to shoot in RAW. When you shoot in RAW, basically what happens is that the camera doesn't do nothing. All it takes is the RAW data, puts it into a file, and then it's up to you to use a software to develop the photo just like we used to do in the old days and um, so you can decide exactly the contrast the white balance 
you know, how warm or cold or how much details you want to have in the photo. This is how you get the best result. To give you an example, this is the exact same shot. The one on the left is a RAW file and the one on the, on the right is a JPEG file. I tried to research them the best that I could, both of them. Check out how the RAW file on the left has richer colors and it's got more detail. If I zoom in and compare, look at this, look how much I have more details here in the RAW file in the sky compared to the JPEG file where I have hardly any details in the, in the, in the clouds. Look all the details I have in the woods here compared to this, which is totally dark. Uh, you know, the overall photo on the left just looks better than the one on the right. And if you, if I would make a big print of that photo, believe me, you would definitely see the difference between RAW and JPEG. And you know, cards today have lots of space and it's very cheap, so why not shoot in RAW? I shoot in RAW 99.9 .9 of the time, and I really advise you to do so. Because believe me, uh, a RAW file has a lot of hidden information, and by using software like Lightrooms or iPhoto, or you know other f aperture in Apple, for example, you can get the best out of your raw files and make your photo looks look great. You will see that some more of that at the end of this course, where we're, we're going to retouch some of the photos we took during the course. So voila, uh, that's the battle raw versus JPEG. The only time I would shoot JPEG is if you are into sport photography and you take thousands and thousands of photo of a football uh, club, you know, playing, for example. And, you know, of course, it takes a lot of more space to shoot in RAW and a lot of more time to edit them. So if you don't want to edit them so you can program your camera to, you know, make the contrast and saturation as you like and you just shoot in JPEG and, you know, you basically you finish your shot and you're done. But if you want to do some really nice landscape or nice portrait and really take the time to retouch your photos, shoot in RAW. Okay guys, now why I want to do a landscape. Now, I want to do it without a tripod. And the way to go about to, without a tripod is the speed needs to be faster than 1 40th of a second. So I, I'm, I'm into AV mode, I'm at 6.3. I'm going to try shooting the photo. Okay. And it tells me that I'm 1 30th of a second. That's too slow. So I'm going to put the f-stop at 5.6 which is still wide enough the number is still high enough so that everything is in focus so now I'm gonna retry okay perfect 5.6 it gives me 1 40th of a second if it gets any darker I won't be able to uh, to take the photo by hand or I would need to boost the ISO as we went over prior so that's about it that's a very simple scene just make sure that your f-stop is close enough, is high enough, like at least four, five or six. Now, if I wanted, for example, to have this in focus, I would need to, um, well, back out. I would need to back out and I probably would need to be at, at f13 or 14 to really have a great depth of view so that I can have this in focus and Notre Dame in focus. But now I'm only trying to get Notre Dame in focus and so 5.6 is big enough. Most of the landscape that I do is between 5.6 and 8 or 9. The only time I go at 11, 12 or 13 is when I want to have something which is in front, uh, close to me in focus also. Okay, so that's about it. Uh, it's a pretty simple uh, way uh, about it. Most people, the mistake they do when they try to do landscape is that they, they would go at 2.8 or, you know, go very open on the f-stop. That's wrong. You need to be minimum at around 5 or 6 or 8 and minimum 1 40th of a second. And if you're not, you have to boost the ISO. And if you, cannot, if you don't want to boost the ISO, take out a tripod. But we will see this in the next video. Okay. Okay guys, so welcome to Paris. This is the, um, this is a great time to take photography. This is the golden hour, meaning that the sun is getting right by the sand, just above the horizontal line. The advantage of taking a photo at this time is that you can shoot right into the sun and there is so much light that you don't need a tripod. 
and I love doing this type of photos, the only thing you need to make sure is maybe underexpose a little bit the photo. Uh, my settings is the following. I'm as usual in automatic white balance. I'm shooting RAW. My f-stop is around 7.1, which is a big depth of field. And I'm gonna, I have a lens which is 100 millimeter. It's pretty, a pretty zoom lens where I can really get that bridge and get that sun behind it. So I'm gonna go for a first shot. Okay, and um, I'm a bit scared that the sky is, is burned. So I'm gonna do what we call an exposure compensation. That is basically you uh, press on the, um, on the button to fire your photo and then you use this wheel, that's on the 5D Mark II, you use a wheel to back down a bit the exposure. So here, for example, I'm at 7.1 and 250th of a second and I'm going to make this, I'm going to make the time go at 400 so it's going to be faster, faster shutter speed. Faster shutter speed means less light. Less light means a darker photo. A darker photo means that we're going to get more from the sky. I mean, the overall photo is going to be pretty dark, but I know I'm going to retouch it later on and I'm going to get back all the details from the shadows. So I'm going to sh shoot this one more time. Okay, it's a pretty dark photo, but I know I will be able to get some details in the sky. So that's a great time. For example, tonight the suns sunset was around, is at 9.30. So what I do is I always shoot about one hour before that. I'm shooting from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. And uh, we have a great sunset tonight in Paris. And you will see it more on the photo than you can see it on the video. So thank you for listening. Okay guys, so this time we're going to do a night shot. Now, the, the time that I like to do night shots is uh, not exactly in the middle of the night. It's right after that the city light goes on, which is went on about two minutes ago. So it's a perfect time. Why is it a perfect time? Because uh, you still have some details in the sky and you can see the beauty of the city in, in the same time, which is something that I like. So, but to be able to do night shots, you need to have a tripod. This is mandatory. No tripod, no photo. The reason is, I'm trying to shoot at 100 ISO because I want to have the nicest photos possible. So, I'm at 100 ISO, I'm in row, automatic white balance, and I'm checking my speed. My, my speed is at 1.3 of a second, that's very long. And there's no way that a human being can hold on for 1.3 of a second uh, a camera without you know having blur so the other thing i'm doing is i put the the photo on the timer two second timer so when i press it's going to wait two seconds and then it's going to take the shot so it makes sure that i have absolutely no movement while taking the shot i look at the first photo and i'm pretty satisfied with it but I want to get a bit darker because I want to get more details in the sky. So I'm going to do my compensation as usual. So I'm going to turn the wheel to the left. Now I'm at one second instead of 1.3. That means that it's going to be a bit more faster. And as the shutter speed is faster, less light is going to come into the uh, camera and it's going to be darker. So let's go and check it out. One second. Okay, that's perfect for me. So, I repeat. Steady tripod, row file, automatic white balance, you know, f7.1.8, and uh, basically that's it. And you can do some compensation, uh, you know, by going a bit left on the exposure, make it a bit darker, but you should get a nice photo. So that's how you do night shots. Okay, so guys, I'm going to try a little challenge here to take a, a portrait in the middle of the night. The only thing I have is this one city light, which is lighting me and lighting my subject, my nephew, Steven. And um, so the way I work, I go about it is I'm going to work in manual mode. Why do I work in manual mode? Because I want to force in the camera to be minimum at 1 40th of a second, because I know that's the, um, 
that's the speed I need to get a, a sharp photo. So I dial in in manual mode, one fortieth of a second. I dial in the biggest aperture I can have on this camera, which is 4.0. And now I take a shot. So I take the shot at 400 ISO. The shot is way too dark. So I'm gonna boost the ISO. I'm at 1000 now. Let's check it at 1000. Okay, it's much better at 1000. But when you take a photo in the middle of the night with a lot of ISO, the noise is gonna go hide in any dark places. So what we need to do is to boost up the ISO enough so that the photo is a bit brighter. It's better to have higher ISO, but a proper, a good exposure, not a too dark exposure, than the opposite. To have like a low ISO, like 800 for, or 600, and have a, having a dark photo, it's gonna be more noisy. So I'm now gonna go at 1,600 ISO and take the photo. Okay, now that's better. So I'm gonna go down, take a couple of shots, and, uh, and voila. I mean, it's far from ideal to take a photo at this time of the night, but it's just to explain you the relationship between the f-stop, between the speed, and between the ISO. I had to go up to 1,600 ISO to get a proper exposure. I was at the aperture at 4.0, which was the max, and I forced in one, one fortieth of a second. So that's, that was the challenge. See you in the next video. Hello, welcome to this new course on photography. We're gonna start with some basic concepts about framing, compositing, and basic rule of photography. We're gonna go over four rules. Rule number one, the quality of light. The definition of photography is writing of the light. It's the writing of the light. And better is your light, better is your photography. You can see in this example that we have a sunset in Paris that's pretty nice. It's actually one of the nicest sunsets I've had over the years. And uh, well, we have a good quality of light, so we have a good photo. It's as simple as that. Unfortunately, usually the uh, good light or nice lights is in the evening or early in the morning when the sun, when the sun rises or when the sun sets. This is another example. Uh, you can see the quality of light is very nice. This is another sunset in Paris. And um, yeah, quality of light equals better photos. Here is another example which I like a lot because this is a very common street. Um, this street's got nothing special at all. And uh, the, I think the photo is pretty nice. And the reason it's pretty nice is because the light was nice. So nice light equals great shots. That's rule number one. Rule number two is the rule of third. The rule of third is you have to uh, imagine while you're taking the photography that you have three lines across from left to right and from top to bottom, as you can see here. This gives you four points that we call the four golden points. One, two, three, and four. The idea is that you put one of the key elements of your message across one of these lines and across this one or two more points. For example, one third of the photo is the river and the bridge and two thirds is the ceiling. Uh, we usually say dead center, meaning if you put your subject in the center, you're dead. Here, we are not in the center. Two thirds of sky, one third of ground. So uh, the rule of third has been applied here on that photo. Same thing for this photo, where we have one third of the ground and two thirds of the ceiling. Now here is the opposite, two thirds is the ground and one third is the sitting. So that's our rule number two, the rule of third. Rule number three, and that is to find an element of deepness in your photo, something that will guide someone, that will guide the person into the photo. You see, photography is a 2D subject. There is no 3D yet. Uh, even if you have 3D in the movie world, you don't have it in the photography world, or it's not totally uh, Let's say workable right now. So uh, any photograph is pretty flat. So you have to find elements that's going to get the eyes of the viewer into the photograph, like this one. 
This is the real world. It's really beautiful to see the photography. It gets you really into it. Here is yet another example of the one we took earlier. The world gets you into the photography. Here is another one. The world gets you into the photography. So that's our next goal. It's to get a mind that's going to get some deepness into the photography. The last and fourth goal is what I call them as a message. This is a place in Paris which is always full of people. I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to take this photo so that I have nobody stand here in front of my camera or cars going by. Because cars and people, usually, unless it's a systematic view to get across, will disperse the view from the two message that I wanted to give you for the example which is the author of Alpha in Paris. So anything that does not contribute to the message needs to be taken out. And anything that contributes to the message needs to be pushed in hard. Uh, this, if you look at this photo, same thing. There is no other than the strap in the eye. You have the railroad getting to the nice car in the building. Same thing here. You know, I waited for cars to be uh, not in the frame when I took the photo. Same thing here. There was a lot of cars passing by, but for one second there was no car. And I took the photo. Uh, you also have some stuff in Paris uh, where you can have a lot of people, but as you are standing up on the roof of the bridge or on the roof or something, you can take a photo where you have no uh, full black element that is not contributing to the message. So that is my last and fourth rule the message. Voila, this is basic rules of photography, but um, they were very helpful to me when I had the school in Paris, and now I try to have the school rule. Always win when I take a photo and I usually get a better result. Now let's say I want to add about the point here of the lights, which is the definition of photography, which is writing a line. Uh, is that when you take a photo, uh, I usually go for a nice lights first and then I find a subject. This is something that I do often. I walk around in Paris, I wait for a nice sunset, and then I take photos. It's very uh, rare that I find a subject first and then wait for the good light. I usually go for the good light first and then find a subject. Because believe me, when the light is good, you can take a garbage can and it will be great. Because all the light around it will be beautiful. So that's really the main rule is a beautiful light, which is beautiful photos. Thank you for listening. Let's come to the next one. Okay, guys, so welcome to this little introduction on retouching. Uh, we are going to retouch four photos out of all the photos I took as part of this training course. I'm using Lightroom 4 because I find that Lightroom is the most powerful software to do uh, retouching from far. The price of Lightroom 4 has been divided by two a few weeks ago, so I think it costs uh, around $150. And if you're really serious into photography, I really advise you to shoot RAW and to develop all your photos in Lightroom because you can get quite some amazing results very fast and very easily. This course is not about Lightroom because that would be too long to introduce. If you want to know more about Lightroom, you can go to my website, which is called photosearch.com, uh, photosearch.com. And if you click here on the App Store link, you have all kinds of courses. One of them is called uh, the Lightroom 4 Quick Start. It's a two hours course. It costs six dollars and it will introduce you very well to Lightroom, how to import your photos, how to retouch them, how to print from Lightroom, how to make web galleries, uh, how to make slideshows, books and much more. So I'm not going to go in depth into how I use Lightroom, but I'll show you a few things. So this is one of the first first photo we took, which was like just a regular daylight photo. And I'm in the develop module of Lightroom. And I'm not going to do much to it, but I'm going to, you see here you have some sliders. I'm just going to use this slider called shadows to open up the shadows. What that's going to do is kind of it's going to brighten up all the dark parts of the area. Then I'm going to bring the highlights, which is the opposite. It's going to take anything which is very uh, light in a photo and darken it. So I'm going to bring this to the left, which is going to darken and make the clouds uh, better. Then I'm going to boost the contrast by going on the right. And uh, I'm maybe going to change a bit the white balance, make the photo uh, slightly a bit more blue by using the temperature slider to the left and adding a bit of magenta to make it a bit 
more reddish, uh, yeah, more purple type of sky. That's just a, an artistic decision, but uh, that's how it goes. Um, the shadows, I'm gonna make them, open them a bit more, something like that. And one thing that I love to do in Lightroom is to add some clarity. Clarity makes the photo pop a little bit more, okay? So th that's fine. And the last thing I'm gonna do is go down here into post crop vignetting and put the slider to the left. That's gonna make the corner of the photo a bit darker, which I think works well when you do a landscapes because it gets the viewer into the photo. So that's it. That's all I'm gonna do on this photo. I'll show you the before. Uh, you have a history on Lightroom where you see all the things you've been doing to a photo. So this is the before. And this is the after. Uh, it's quite a change, and you know that was I could have gone to other settings, but I was just to demonstrate to you the power and the rapidity of Lightroom. Next was this uh, night shot photo. So on this one, I'm just gonna bring up a bit the shadow so we see a bit what's going on. I'm gonna do the burn the highlights down, make them a bit darker, something like that. Then I'm going to use the whites and blacks. The way the whites and black works is that you press the Alt key on your keyboard and you move the slider, the white slider to the right until it's all black, until you see some pixels appearing, which is the case here. And uh, that's the formula. And then you let go. And uh, basically you have brightened up the photo and the sun now has some uh, white pixels in it, like 100% pixels. So maybe I'm going to back it down a little bit because I don't want uh, these pixels to be completely burned, meaning they are at 100% white. There is no more detail. I want a bit of detail in the sky. And I'm going to do the same thing with the blacks. Uh, I'm going to darken a bit the photo until we have some points which are black. Okay, that's kind of cool. I'm going to change the temperature because I think I want to give an overall more warmer tone. So I'm going to put my temperature slider to the right and the tint to the right to make the whole thing a bit warmer. That's maybe a bit much, so I'm gonna back it down. But I wanted something like this, you know, really you, where you would see the sun over a silhouette of Paris. Um, then I'm gonna go into the um, noise reduction because there must be a bit of noise in the dark places here. So you've got a thing which is called noise reduction. I'm gonna put this to about 30. It's gonna take care of the noise. You probably can't see it on the video but that's, uh, it does make a difference. And um, and then I'm just gonna go to the same thing that we did before, the post crop vignetting, move this a bit to the left uh, to darken a bit the, the side of the photo. And that's it. So let me show you the before. That's the before, the retouching. Okay, and that's the after the retouching. Not much of a change, but you know, makes it a bit pop a bit more. Okay, next we have uh, the the night photo that we took with the city lights on. This is really always a nice time to take photos. I'm gonna do the same thing. I go up here. I'm gonna open up the shadows. That's the only thing I do all the time. And I'm gonna burn down the highlights. I'm gonna make the contrast pop a little bit more. I'm gonna move the exposure slider a bit to the right to make it a bit brighter. Okay, now the sky is still too bright. And there's a special feature in Lightroom that I love to take care of that, it's called the Neutral Density Filter. You, this is this little icon here. Basically what it does is you can choose a function like exposure and it's gonna act on a gradient. So you see my exposure is a bit to the left, so it's, it's a bit dark and I click and drag and make, I'm gonna make just the sky darker. Check this out. I'm gonna boost down the exposure and uh, yes, that's it. See, before, after. So the, it's it's like a local correction. I love that option in Lightroom 4. I'm sorry if I'm going a bit fast, but this was just to show you, not to learn your Lightroom. I have a separate training on that. It's just to show you what you can do with some with the photos. I'm gonna move my, tint sli my temperature slider to the right to make it warmer a little bit, and maybe add some magenta also into it. Something like that to make it pop a bit more. Uh, I prefer the colors. And um, maybe I'm gonna brighten up a bit the exposure, slightly bit. Yeah, something like that. I'm gonna take back my neutral density filter, select it, make it even darker. 
so that we get still some details in the sky. Okay, and I'm gonna boost a bit the clarity on this one. I think it's gonna work fine, make it pop even more. And I'm gonna go down here, same thing, and do the post crop vignetting. Voila, something, no, that's too much, that's way too much. Just a little bit of post crop vignetting, just to make the some more details in the sky, something like this around this. You know what? I'm not even gonna do it because it's already too dark here. Okay, so I'll show you the before, that's the before, and that's the after. You know, using raw files, see how the photo pops a lot more. Okay, next and last is our little portrait of our friend, my nephew, Stephen. Uh, so I'm gonna change the temperature. I think it's a bit too yellow, so I'm gonna go back to the blues. Uh, you know, go on the left on the temperature to make it a bit more blue. Maybe uh, add a bit of magenta to take out the green. There's too much green in the light here. Uh, something like this. Okay, I'm gonna open up the shadows a little bit. I'm gonna bring down the highlights and boost a bit the contrast. All right, and then this is, I know it was a 1600 photo, uh, ISO photo, so there's a lot of noise. So check this out. I'm going to the noise reduction. I'm gonna go the whole way to 40 and look how the noise is disappearing. But then I'm gonna boost a bit the sharpening to sharpen a bit the photo. Okay, so not much, but it makes a difference. Maybe a bit of post crop vignetting also on this one, you know, just to so have more attention on our character, you know, our person here, and boost slightly the exposure. Okay, something like this. So, okay, we started here, and now, well, it's not much on the change on this one, and we are here. That's the after retouching, but we took care of the noise and various things. Voila, that's what you can do. That's just a little glimpse of what you can do in Lightroom. Thank you very much for following this course with me. I hope you learned some things. I invite you to check my website if you want to find out more training from me on Lightroom, Photoshop, or photography. Uh, I love teaching and doing this course. I really do hope you did learn something and that uh, it was, as promised, simple. And I'll see you on another training. Thank you very much for being there. Okay guys, I hope you like this course and if you want some more, uh, check out this link to my full library of courses where I cover many topics on photography. Thank you very much for being there and I will see you in the next episode. Mesdames et messieurs, au revoir.